If you're looking for proven ways to take your fundraising results to the next level, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, hosted by Tammy Zonker. Tammy has trained and led thousands of nonprofit organizations to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars, and is also recognized as one of America's top 20 fundraising experts. This is the podcast where Tammy equips and empowers amazing fundraising pros like you to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now, let's hear from Tammy. We'll start the show in just a moment after a word from our sponsor. Support for this show is brought to you by our friends at Bloomerang. Bloomerang offers donor management and online fundraising software that helps small to medium nonprofits, just like First Tee of Greater Akron, a nonprofit that empowers kids and teens through the game of golf. After just one year with Bloomerang, First Tee of Greater Akron doubled their unique donors, improved donor stewardship, and raised more funds. Keep listening to hear how they did it or visit bloomerang.com forward slash intentional to learn more. Again, that's bloomerang.com forward slash intentional. Today on the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, I am delighted to be talking with Jason Ellinger. When asked to describe himself, Jason says, first and foremost, he's a husband to his beautiful wife and father to an amazing two-year-old. Of secondary importance, he says he's co-founder of Beard and Bowler, a commercial filmmaker, a magic maker, along with his co-founder, Matt Carpenter. They help nonprofits raise funds and awareness through the power of storytelling through video. He has worn all the hats building his business, including, quite literally, an English bowler, and has had the privilege to work with an impressive list of organizations, starting out as a hard news journalist and fast-forwarding to Beard and Bowler. Jason says the best is yet to come. I first met Jason at the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference in San Antonio last year. We were both speakers, and I was blown away. He's a phenomenal storyteller. He's curious, generous, big-hearted, and humble. He's also hard to miss. (laughs) This very tall man with a thick beard wearing a bowler hat, exuding the warmth and the most inviting energy you will ever encounter. He's dedicated himself to making a positive and lasting ding in the world through storytelling. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you for those kind words. That was pretty awesome. Well, great intro. I speak the truth. So first, I have to ask, Beard and Bowler, how did you land on that name for your video production company? Okay. So my wife and I were really into the show Penny Dreadful on, on Showtime. And it was Josh Hartnett, and I can't remember who else. And Josh Hartnett wore this bowler hat in the show. And uh, it was 2015 and she thought it would be cute. So she got me one for Christmas and I opened it up and I'm like, what is this? Who do you think I am that I'm going to just wear a bowler hat around? This is, it's not the 18th century. So it sits in the closet for about a year or so. And then my partner and I, fast forward, we're talking about forming this company. What do we call it? And I'm like, I like something and I think that's strong, like an ampersand, maybe beard. Can we work beard in there? Cause we both had beards at the time. Could we do that? And uh, I was like, let me think on this a little bit. I found the bowler in my closet. I came back to the office the next day and I showed him and my partner's the type of guy that just has no filter. So I knew he'd say something <laughs> if it just, I was totally expecting to look ridiculous. Take that off right now. And I walk in holding my breath and he goes, I like it. It suits you. And I was like, really? And I got all excited. I'm like, what do you think about Beard and Bowler? What do you think about that name? He's like, I like it. Let's run it past the agency we're working with. It's awesome. So nothing really exciting there, but that's the origin of the name. I love it. There's so much serendipity there. I absolutely love it. Yeah. And your wife essentially gets credit for it. <laughs> absolutely. I'll give her all the credit. So Jason, you know better than anyone, that in fundraising and in life, storytelling is everything. 
So what's your process for crafting great stories through video? We have a pretty extensive process and I'll try and nutshell it as best I can for creating videos, but it all starts with a discovery call. And uh, a lot of times we'll get RFPs sent to us or the nonprofit or the client will say, we want this, that, and the other. And we say, okay, great. Let's jump on a call. Let's talk about what your goals are, who your target audience is, where this is going to be played. Then we'll make some recommendations based off of that. I know there's a lot of GWCs, we call them guys with cameras, who'll just show up and say, all right, I'm here. What do you want to shoot? You got some questions for me? You know, what's your B-roll? <clears throat> and they put that all in a nonprofit. And I can tell they've worked with a GWC before when they get on the call and they're very hesitant and like, realizing that this is going to be a big, huge process with a lot of work on their plate. And we say, we literally need you to introduce us to somebody and we'll tell you who, and then we don't need you again until the screening. You're welcome to join us on set and listen in. We have a little headphone station in Video Village for you set up, but we don't need you after that. We just, we need to get some information from you now and some information in pre-production if we move forward and then make some introductions for us. And we handle all the logistics because what's happening when we're handling logistics for meeting anybody new is we're developing rapport with the person that we're going to talk to who's going to tell us their life story and some of their deepest, darkest stuff, right? So that rapport building starts early because a lot of the people that we interview are working people and they have two or three jobs. So um, they are hard to get a hold of. Not all of them are on email. So you'll have to email a few times and you'll call and follow up with a text and then you'll finally get something back on text. You're going back and forth. They missed your first one. They missed your second one. And then you finally get on a Zoom call with them. And by that time, they, they are indebted to you because they know how hard you've reached out to them. And you're just like, hey, John, no worries. How's the wife and kids? It's job number two treating you. Like you already have a bit of a relationship. So that's just part of what makes people feel comfortable when they're talking to us on camera. But there's a pretty extensive pre-interview, maybe about 30, 45 minutes if they're a talker where we gather some high-level information. And then we take that and we bring it back and find out the points that they were passionate and they were emotional and we'll double down on those for our day of filming. And it's important to establish a relationship early on now. So that's a little bit into our process of storytelling. I love it. And I just want to distinguish, I think it was so powerful in that first bit when you talked about, like a lot of organizations do, they just say, well, we need a video. Can you do that? And you say, okay, who is the target audience? Who's this video for? And essentially, what do you want them to know, feel, or do as a result of viewing it, right? And sometimes that kind of clarity is just not present. So number one, I think that's absolutely brilliant. And number two, just having been the person inside the nonprofit working with videographers, or hopefully not just guys with cameras, but real storytellers. So many of the people that we're featuring in these videos who are so generous to tell their story. And it's very foreign for them to have a camera crew in their living room or to be in this space where this camera crew is shooting and really telling the milestones in their courageous journey. And so I love that you really are intentional about building the rapport and the relationship beyond just their story, but with them as humans, as people with lives. I just think that's, honestly, that's a game changer. And I think anyone who's looking to create videos to tell those kind of stories, now, if you didn't already know, those are like two really important things to look for in a video partner. Some of the highest praise that we've got was having the candidate that we'd interview show up to the gala because we do some fancy stuff like same day edits and everything and hush videos but having them show up and we're there working and then they see us and the stories played thank you for doing it justice i was so afraid i was going to look crazy or ridiculous or sound stupid and i don't think they understand the lengths that we go to make them look as competent as possible where we'll just edit out maybe six ums from a sentence and then cover it with B-roll. So you didn't even know that they said their sentence 10 times more confidently than they would even in person. But just to 
get them to look as best and as empowered as possible. Yeah. Yeah. To honor them. I love that. So talk to me about when you're working with maybe an executive director or a CEO or a board member on telling their story. I have found that sometimes they are the most resistant to open up. Like working with program participants is a cakewalk compared to working with some executives because I think they feel like they have to be professional and impressive versus open-hearted and authentic. So how do you get to the emotional essence of a story with an executive who might be stuck in that I must be a professional space? We work with both for-profit and nonprofit. And one nonprofit I'm thinking of in particular, uh, the executive director was former high up at NBC, MSNBC, and came from a big communications background. And he's now, there's no getting gunk. And I think in our second or third year of working with him, he finally came on camera and you could tell he was tense. Typically, our stories are client journey, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, but we will need that authority voice from the organization or from the company speaking to why and how that they were able to help and adding credibility to the client's uh, story. So in those cases, what we've done in the past is a lot of people demand the scripts or the questions, the interview questions in advance, and we don't send those. We will just do what is a pre-interview. And during the pre-interview, there's rarely a question that we ask that they're just like, oh, hi, I have no idea. These are questions that are baked into your DNA, if you will. You will know the answers to these. They're not going to stump you. Like these are the questions that you live and breathe every day. And if you happen to get stumped on something, we're not going to put that in there. That would just be a bad look on everybody. So getting them comfortable with the pre-interview process. And then by the end of it, they understand pre-interviews recorded, but it's just a Zoom call that we won't be using. By the end of it, they're like, oh, okay, I did that pretty well. Cool. We're going to do the exact same thing when we come to shoot. And that eases their mind a lot. In, in the rare cases, I've had two or three times someone showed up with a script. And I think it was my partner, Matt, just saw the script and was like, snatched <laughs> it up. <laughs> he was just like, nope, no script. And he said, talk to me about this. Why would, and this was, a, I think this was a financial consultant. And he was like, why would anybody hire you? And said, well, because of this point that I wrote your script at this point. I don't know, tell me why. Why do I care? Why do I care? And he pushed him. And he kept going back to the script until about the third or fourth time. And he's, because I'm blanking this and blanking that and this, I'm awesome, right? <laughs> we had to bleep out a couple of things, but we're like, that's it. That's the take that we're going to use. That's the natural response. Authenticity rules. That's what we were looking for. Nothing scripted at all. So it's a process. Sometimes it's a dance. and uh, But in the end, if you're unscripted, it comes across best. Yeah, it's a conversation. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. But I think, too, the way you described the pre-interview is also like building rapport and confidence. Yes. Yeah. Huge rapport building. You almost end up with a bond with that person after the fact. I've been on vacation in Cape May and seen someone that I've interviewed and you run into them, you don't know what the response is going to be. And this is like a year later, right? The question always comes, did I do your story justice? And it's just, oh, so happy to see you, old friend, because who else sits there and listens to you for 45 minutes without saying even their responses are nonverbal. Like our responses are nonverbal because we can't step on their lines, right? So who else? listens to you like that aside from a therapist. So you create more than just even just reports, like a bond with people. So yeah, absolutely. So I have a challenge that I run into often. I'm not a videographer, but I will often help craft remarks for talks or for an annual report or who knows what. And I find that some executive directors are so proud of the organization's history. And so when you ask them to tell me your story, tell us the, why this organization is amazing, sometimes they'll start with, well, because we were founded in 1862. What do you do with that? I listen and then 
I take their proverbial script and I throw it out. But it's funny because we've had three in a span of a week come to us with, it's our 40th anniversary, it's our 70th, 150. And they say, oh, we want to do something big. And it's great because it's an opportunity for them to actually invest. And everybody sees it as an opportunity to invest. And we say, this has nothing to do and should not be in your video. The same with your history, the same with all 27 of your board members. They do not go in this video. The video has one job, and it's to move a person emotionally enough so that they're ready to take action. And when you start saying facts and figures and statistics, audiences go cold. And I think that's a big misunderstanding about video in general. You have to jam everything in there. They must know about this, and they don't have to, and nobody cares. I'm sorry. Nobody cares, right? It has one job. Just get people emotionally open and understand that people not only donate with their hearts, they buy with their gut and their hearts too. It's like you, yeah, that SUV is good enough. So you bought it because you liked it, right? And then you're going to post-rationalize later. Yeah, four-wheel drive, five-star safety rating for my kiddo. You like that and you bought it, right? That's how you move through life. And then you post-rationalize those decisions later. People do the same thing when they're giving. So if your job in the video is not to give them all of your history and information, please stay away from that. It's yes. just to move them to a point emotionally to take that next step, clear, concise, one CTA. One call to action. I love that. Because the truth is nothing happens until somebody feels something. Yeah. Let's build on that. When working with testimonials to tell their stories, we really have to walk a thin line. And you really spoke to this a bit earlier. We want to evoke the emotional truth, the essence of their story, while ensuring that we honor their dignity and their courageous journey to healing or to that next level, whatever the mission is. And we want to be sure that we're not reinforcing stereotypes or re-traumatizing people or having them feel like they've been shamed or diminished in some way or othering people, right? So... How do you do that? I mean, definitely building rapport. You've made that really important point. But what advice can you give to our listeners as they're curating or cultivating people to be testimonials and as they're working with storytellers like yourself? This recently has become even more of an important issue in the post-George Floyd world. It's funny that's even a thing, but Everybody is paying attention now and everybody is looking. And I remember videos a while back was just, there was a person that they helped the hero and the young man, and then one of their board members, because that was who they could get and who could talk for the organization. And we went along with it. After the fact, the, I think the executive director said something to the effect of, can I be honest here? And I'm like, absolutely, please. And she said just two words. And she was like, white savior. And that just took the air <laughs> out of my lungs, right? It's something you probably wouldn't have thought about in 2019. But right. now, and everybody's hyper aware of it. So even now going forward in our videos, and we learn from our mistakes and we're open with our mistakes too, the hero being the person, prophet that has the success story, we'll tell them, look, we're trying to stay away from language that's diminishing and we really want to empower and empower you. And that even goes from down to our camera angles that, that we choose to make it more of a hero shot as opposed to a looking down on shot. So we will only tell the success stories. And we've also learned that the hard way too, very early on, just people that, let's say, substance abuse, right? Telling the success story too early and then the person relapses. So now we are clear, like from day one, let's make sure somebody has made it through your program all the way and has been successful now. But using empowering language, speaking with the talent on set, making sure that they're on the same page with us. And the angle, because you can tell people, even if they're not like professionally trained actors, which most of the people aren't, you can tell them this is the angle that we're going for. And even down to the point of, hey, let's not call it this parent organization is what people know. So we're going to refer to it as this. And people will take that instruction like they're give them a little bit more credit. There's instructions that you can give to people on set. But then also we have a number of people listening 
to the interviews that we do. So I'm there and I'm kind of, I'm almost like an actor. I'm reading my lines that were written by my story editor and he's listening in too. And we use a Google doc when we do interviews. So I'm talking to them. We call him Daniel the Phantom because he just, he's not on video, but you see him moving around the Google doc, copying and pasting and striking through as we've answered some things. So having a second set of ears listening in when you're live on the day, like, hey, that sounded a little bit, maybe we could just ask that one more time is always a good idea. 90% of the time client is on set with us too, and they'll have a pair of headphones and like, they're listening to content very closely, right? Just making sure I have a nod of approval from them too is like, this is the type of language that you use. Maybe it's not students, maybe it's scholars, just little nuances that you wouldn't normally pick up unless you were fully engrossed in that organization. So it's always good to have a second and a third pair of ears. And then from there, our process is a little bit more extensive, but if you're editing video, then you have your actual editor. And then we sit down as a team and we review it all together and make sure that there's nothing that fell off for Iggy or was cut in a certain way that could just be misconstrued. So from there, we show the nonprofits themselves. And that's when maybe some of that language that they use that's specific to their organization comes out and we'll get input on that side. So there's layers to it when we're doing the stories. If you're a smaller nonprofit and just don't have the resources, that's okay. And it's just good to be able to run things by your team. And chances are, even if you're writing a blog or a newsletter, hey, John, did this sound off to you? Probably is if you're even questioning it. So whether that's somebody else you work with or even just a parent or a spouse, always have a second or third opinion before you send that out to make sure it's empowering. You told me a story once about a review you were doing, one of those early reviews with a client And you said, look, so what do you think? And they gave you a two-word response that kind of set you back a little bit, but it was an important learning moment. Would you share that with our- Yeah, we're big on shielding, but even more so our failures because we want other people to learn from them and not make those same mistakes. And just as interviewing all of your board members and talking about your history would be a mistake, so is this one, but a little bit more delicate. And we were doing a client story and uh, it was a nonprofit. There's an Asian American gentleman, and there was a older board member who was our guide and uh, guy, our hero, and told a great story. They were both very well spoken, a, a lot of great sound bites, and then everybody loved it. And the executive director said something, and it was just like a, "Can I be honest with you?" Like she almost did not want to say this, right? But she was like, just two words. She said, "White savior." And uh, that was not something that was on our radar. I don't think that was really on. I mean, it was on people's radar, but not in like George Floyd world where it's everything is hypersensitive and everybody's looking and thinking about these things culturally because we're now forced to take a look at just even the language that we're using, right? So for us, that was a learning curve like, hey, our guide just as important as our hero and they have to be representative too so that it it doesn't look like things are unbalanced and even though that may not have been like a fair statement considering knowing both of these people were successful right and it might not have been a fair statement just the optics of it right so somebody who had not known or seen this organization might have thought that too so those are the mistakes that we learn from and adjust and make sure that we are sensitive to now. Yeah, it's it's foolish because as culture shifts, like I said, that would have been a conversation four years ago, right? But as culture shifts, so does the video and storytelling style that we use and have to be sensitive to. I think there's two really important lessons in that story. One, for me, it harkens back to Dr. Maya Angelou. And one of her amazing quotes was, when you know better, you do better. That's a little bit. And we're learning, like we're learning and we're doing better every time we learn. And the key is to learn faster and honestly fail faster, right? So we can all grow together. And the second, I think really important point of that is you want to work with a video production company where you can have courageous conversations and no one gets defensive. You hear each other out and you say, oh, I didn't see that. I see it now. Let's do something about it. 
So that's yeah. partnership, right? That's not like a vendor. That's a partner. We like to come in and say no ego. Uh, and with nonprofits, they'll tell you like, we don't like this and this is our hard earned running. With some of the agencies that we work with um, that are large agencies, they're almost like scared to give you their feedback and then their clients' feedback. I know you guys are artists and you do your thing and this is like great and everything. And just, it's all right, man. Just tell us like, <laughs> no ego. You know your client better than we do. Like, it's okay. We've got two revisions included in this. And if you need more, we can do that too. So nothing you see is final and that you could always re-edit it. But we like to come in with no ego to make sure we're all on the same page, but also we're delivering the best product possible. And it's something I even tell new editors as I bring them on, like you have to have a little bit of a thick skin here because it's not that we're, well, we are, I am very nitpicky with what comes out of our shop because we, we want to be proud of it. But if I could duplicate myself, I'd have edits for my own self. So I like to lead with that line to let them know that there's going to be revisions and we're going to sit down as a team before client even sees it and try and pick it apart as best we can so that <laughs> we don't get that from them so that it's gone through three or four, yeah. eight revisions sometimes before draft one is seen to client. So yeah, no ego. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. First T of Greater Accra needed to switch from an outdated donor management system to something more user-friendly. With Bloomerang, they found that and more. Here's Executive Director Josh Smith sharing what he likes about Bloomerang. We love Bloomerang because it's so, like, it's very user-friendly. We're able to do more because our daily tasks of thanking donors and sending thank you notes have been cut more than half because of Bloomerang. Year over year, we have raised more funds. So obviously, I think Bloomerang's been a, a huge part of that. By investing in a donor management system that they actually love using, First Tee of Greater Akron was able to raise more funds and continue creating lasting change in their community. To listen to the full interview with First Tee of Greater Akron, visit bloomerang.com forward slash intentional or click the link in the show notes. That's good. I think too, like you're really like igniting my thinking around this. I suspect it's really important to identify who are the reviewers and decision makers on the client side. Because just like a year-end appeal or a case for support, like if you try to produce something by consensus, that's a recipe for disaster and diluting messages and conflict. So understanding at the end of the day, I mean, you started with this. What do we, what's, who's the target audience? What do we want them to do? What's the call to action? And ultimately, internally, who are the few, the fewest number possible, I suspect, decision makers on this creative process? What have you encountered and what do you suggest to, say, a marketing director or chief development officer who's aiming to produce video for the purpose of fundraising, and they know they need some buy-in on the finished product before it's finished. So typically, we like to have all decision makers, as in everybody who's going to have a say in the video on the call day one, from the time we're doing pre-production. Yeah. And the reason that's so important is because we take everybody on a journey. And we like to say one story. Stay focused on that one story. The more focused you are, the better the result's going to be. But also to make them, some of the things discussed earlier, this is not an informational piece. This is a story. It's going to have a little information in it, but just going to be sprinkled in there. So we're not going to go into the depths of your anniversary or your history or all of your board members. Like that needs to be a huge on setting expectations up front. So once they're there, they understand like, hey, these questions, we've done research. We're not just going to show up on a camera and be like, let's go, you know, like on production day. They understand that, hey, these guys know what they're talking about. This is their specialty. And that a little bit of mutual respect is established up front, but then also the expectations of what this piece is going to be and that it's not going to be 10 different interviews. It's going to be two, maybe three. And the more focus you get, the better. 
And then once we are on the screening night, it's a lot easier, I found, to get decision makers and executive directors on the screening than it is on uh, pre-production calls. It was like, yes, I want to see this. So I actually record the screenings. Like I don't send over a file. I walk them in and I watch it with them. And that's some of my team's favorite piece. And I could tell like guys get a little bit tense when they're on these because sometimes the client doesn't understand the weeks or even month plus that they poured into this back and forth and arguing internally as a team to, to make it this. And we don't argue, but there's the back and forth that goes into this and that they're waiting with bated breath to like hear what the results are. And I do that for, for two reasons. One, to get that excited. Wow, that was awesome. The tears, the emotional reaction, because that's what we're going for with yeah. your target yes. audience. It needs to generate that same feeling in them. And if it's doing that in you, then that's a good sign it's gonna work. Night of the Gala, this is your first time seeing this too. But the other reason I'd record these screenings is I can tell if somebody loses interest, if they pick up the cell phone, if they look away, what part was that? That part was moving too slow. Let's speed that up a little bit. And uh, it just gives us valuable feedback that we wouldn't have before. So getting buy-in day one, on that discovery call and then that pre-production call. And then last day on the screen with you. Very good. Super helpful. How are you seeing nonprofits use video to retain donors and to increase giving? You mentioned some examples around, you know, like anniversary gala or a fundraising event. But what are some of the other ways that video is being used effectively? So I guess I could just give answer that with a story because one of my favorite examples is we work with an organization and they used it for their gala that was previously bringing in five seventy six hundred k for the night and then they introduced video i think this is our second year working with them and they hit 1.1 million and they broke like all of their records that was a sponsorship from wells fargo that covered the video so i always encourage sponsorship for media when you can and then you tag them and right in the beginning brought to you by sponsored by that same video that their executive director took to a chef they did a culinary school where some of their clients going through rehab went to a culinary school so they'd have a purpose with their life and they wouldn't relapse one of the chefs that they brought it to had a bad relationship with one of their culinary students and a relationship was closed the executive director showed up with a success story from one of the students that they had and the chef watched it on his phone and just broke down in tears and said, all right, I get it. I see it. I want to do something. This is the same clip, mind you, that they like made another 400K with at their gala. And he started, he called all of his okay. chef friends and he started a brand new fundraising event with all of them called The Tasting. And it raised 200,000 its first night, first time out. They went on to do a second year. And now it's just going to be a regular fundraising thing because of that emotional spark that they created inside the chef. And now it's just like an event that lives on its own and can't be stopped, right? That same video, their director of development took to a small family foundation who was also touched by the video and said, okay, what can we do? Let's do a grant for 2 million over two years to the culinary school. Those are the types of results that are my favorite because it's not about making a buck, it's about we made a difference that's going to affect generations and just like the ROI you can't even measure almost. And, you know, not to mention five years later, I'm getting calls from people that were at that organization and now are at a new organization and want to hire us because they were at the gala. Like the quote from an employee was, I used to like that organization when I worked there. And I went to the gala and I saw your video and I understood. And then I fell in love with the organization. So there were ripple effects that we didn't even understand at the time of like employee morale and like understanding their mission with the organization. Those were a few of the examples, but your emails a couple hundred to thousand times more likely to be opened and read if there's video in the subject line in brackets with a video in the email and a play button, like something physical like that. And these are facts from like marketing agencies that we work with that implement video into their client stuff where, you know, their clients are paying 10, 15, 20 K a month to this marketing agency for these insights. So between email, landing pages, social media, snackable pieces that we use to tease back to the main landing page, there are infinite possibilities. But sometimes my favorites are those one-on-ones 
if you have an active board going out there and doing their job in fundraising, a director of development who's worth their salt, right? This is their best tool. Like, who are you? Let me show you three minutes or less. This is who we are. And it's not even like we serve this many thousands of people. It was just like somebody that they've helped get from point A to point B. And for some reason, we understand things that way and the light bulb just clicks. Power of one. And I, I love that I'm hearing about repurposing video. So maybe you did create it for the gala, but it has legs, right? It can be applied in so many scenarios, candidly, for years afterwards. Like you want fresh content, but man, some of those become like the favorite scene from a favorite movie for a lot of supporters. And I think it's a really important story for organizations who maybe have been apprehensive to, in, to spend money on video. They have viewed video storytelling as an expense versus an investment. And when you told that story, a $400,000 increase at the gala, repurposed later for a $200,000, then shared with the foundation for a $2 million over two years. I hope I got all those numbers right. But the point is very powerful and such an incredible return on investment. Yeah. We started shifting yeah. our language to investing and it actually has attracted some foundations to us. Let me rephrase that, forward thinking foundations. There's the there's a lot out there. We give the 501c3 program, but there were a few who got it and invested in a gala video for the return because they have the same nonprofit. And so here they get to do just come to them and say like, hey, why don't you demand a fit, so to speak, you know, and invest in them to help them help themselves. So foundations are, are some of my favorite. We've got a few of them that we work with for uh, either empowering the nonprofits that they work with Hurrying the nonprofits that they work with, or just gifting it and underwriting the cost of that. So good. You have a partner, a co founder, Matt Carpenter. And what I've gleaned from the website is you're the creative. He's the get it done, get it across the finish line guy. And that you two really are like this perfect pairing. You describe each other as family as brothers. And on your website, there's a video where you're talking about one another. It's so, first of all, the angle that the video shot is just beautiful. And in that video, Matt says that you, Jason, have a story that needs to be told. What's that story? You know, that story, like any good story, has layers and thread lines and begins with my experiences growing up. Another thread high school and starting outlet to express myself. And then another one is what led me here to find my purpose kind of behind the camera. I think the best and most compelling is yet to come. Though. I guess what I could talk to you about is what led me here. And that was, I started this video company in 07 and just in time for that recession and married, need a day job, need some stability, some benefits, and end up wanting to stay in the same field and keep my senses sharp so I get a job with the news. I was a hard news photojournalist. I had the 4 a.m. to noon shift, and we were a 24-hour news station, which means we had to have constant content on. We'd go to everything that the big news stations wouldn't cover, right? So every fire, shooting, stabbing, murder, assault, I was there covering it like before they even cleaned the blood off the scene. For me, that was my day in and day out. And I got to see a lot of the underbelly of New Jersey and New York, Long Island, a lot of the areas that I covered. And I think a low point for me was my second 11-year-old funeral where the reporter was just tweeting on our phone, as was our job, kind of like me without looking up and says, get the mother, like the mother. And as I'm going to the mom, like, first of all, what do you mean, get the mother? But second of all, as I'm going yeah. to this weeping mom with now cameras around her who just lost her son, I'm still kind of justifying it to myself. Like, hey, maybe somebody will see this. Maybe somebody will learn. Maybe I won't be back here again. And the next month, week, day, even, I'll be back in the same area, same sort of thing. And it kind of dawned on me, maybe I'm doing more harm than good in telling all the negative of what's happening. And don't get me wrong, you'll see like occasional feel-good stories on the news with puppies or the nonprofit who's made it 
and got to the news, but they quickly skip over that. And they did none of those stories justice. And I remember hearing from a guy who worked for the record. He was a still photographer and those guys saw some stuff. He knew what I was attempting to do. I had just started planning that with my partner now. And he goes, I'm the hero. I got a guy. His name's Willie. He's on the corner of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and Rosa Parks. And if you know anything about the hood, like the streets that are named after those places, stuff goes down. <laughs> so, and he's on the intersection of the corner of two of them. And he's across from two burned down buildings on an empty lot where two other buildings probably burned down to the ground and there was nothing there. And he took the land and he started, nothing would grow because the dirt was so toxic. He had to bring, he was so committed though, he brought in his own dirt to grow on the land. The guy was working a full-time job. He was about 70 when he started this and not even he's from South Carolina, right? And, and in Patterson, Jersey. nothing would grow there. He brought in his own dirt. He teaches the kids in the area. He mentors them how to work the earth and dirt with their hands. He's a, a positive example to them. And he owns a farmer's market every other weekend. And if you can't afford to donate to what he's got going on, you know, take a bag of fruits, take a bag of vegetables. And what ended up starting mm. to happen was the area around him just started getting better. Like store across the street that was burned down, got rebuilt. And now it's like, a thriving community shop. And then his garden itself is just like this little oasis when you're passing, like, you know, when it's crowded in those areas, like house after little house after little house. And then this little beautiful garden there. It's just like a little oasis. Those are the stories that I want to tell. If I could tell that story every day, I'd die happy. Those are the stories that are going to inspire the soccer mom from the next town over to do her own thing because it's so... I don't want to say small or insignificant, but it's a consumable step that people can take. And they don't know that this is, and people might be scared to follow that voice inside them that's saying that you should do this or you should do this. I can't. Who do you think I am? Like, well, I'm not made or equipped for that. If we could shine a light on all the people that are already doing that in the world, I think that would inspire a lot of other people to act. So that became our mission. That was to tell the stories that are going to inspire the world to positive action instead of the negative ones. I love that. And that's more than a little ding in the world, right? Or the, mm. Really significant. Thank you for sharing that story. It's really beautiful. All right, Jason, at the end of each episode, I like to ask a few insightful questions just to add a little more value to our listeners. So are you ready? I think so. All right, let's do it. The first question, what's the best storytelling advice you've ever received? Sarah Elkins, she says, I think it's printed on a mug somewhere too. Your story doesn't have to be epic to be meaningful. <laughs> the longer one is we use the seven elements of story in all of our stuff. So it's just something that you have to just understand that it is very calculated. If you look at a Pixar movie, I've actually timed a lot of the Disney movies I watch with my three-year-old to see from the time the villain goes away or the problem is solved to credits is a matter of moments, like a percentage of the movie, like holding the tension. So there's a formula that every single movie and TV show follows for story. And there are seven elements to the story. So I'm not just going to say like, oh yeah, go out and tell a story. There's an actual formula. We have them on our website. We give them away if anyone is interested, but there's an actual formula that you need to follow to tell a good story. Yeah. That's the long answer. Science and art. What book do you recommend to our audience and why? Donald Miller's Story Brand. Depends where you're at in your journey. Like if you're an entrepreneur, I always say start with why by Simon Sinek. That's my, my favorite starting place. And then $100 startup and, and lean startup. But if we're talking about story and how to effectively communicate, uh, Story Brand is just one of those books. It makes things where so abundantly clear with multiple examples on how you can just clean up your website, your communication, your messaging to be clean and concise and consumable. Because we have a lot going on. We're hit three to 8,000 pieces of marketing per day. And if you are not 
very clear and intentional. Even if you show a loved one, someone who cares about you and is invested what you're working and you're not clear, it might be too much for even them. So Story Brand is one of those books that just like will really help you get clear. on this. Awesome. We will include a link to that in the show notes. What are the three most important traits a successful storyteller must possess? Patience and or silence. When we interview people, we don't respond with words. So we're in a Zoom call. We interview people. Even on set, I'm in a teleprompter and I'm interviewing people. And then I ask them a question and I let them think about it and they answer it. And then afterwards I nod, but I'll wait because I know there's more. And a lot of times we are uncomfortable with that sort of silence in real everyday conversations. But when you're interviewing somebody and you're telling a story, if you wait, sometimes that's the best stuff that we've ever gotten. It, it subtly communicates to a person that I need more. Tell me more. Do better. And they do. Nine times out of 10, they do. Mm. That's number one. Number two, a process, a good process for storytelling. It's not just show up and ask some questions. It's do some research. Like you did research for this call. I can tell <laughs> you watched some videos that I forgot about and you came with a plan and with a script and written out questions. So when I showed up for the news, I was like, Hey, tell me what's going on here today. A great day for this event, right? Like I had three standard questions that I'd use, but like there wasn't any preparation for it. And now it's like, so calculated and thought out, research done into it, preparations, pre-interviews. So being prepared is another one. And if you're telling your own story, just don't underestimate the power of your own story. I tell my story two, three times a week sometimes. <laughs> the affinity it creates with anybody new that I meet, sometimes I forget and undervalue the power. That's great advice. What's your favorite fundraising or storytelling tool? You know, I'm a little biased here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be in it doing this if I didn't think it was video. Um, I think video has the potential to affect the most amount of people with the least amount of effort and input. Don't get me wrong, it is a lot of effort and energy that goes into a piece, but we live in an age of digitalness and it has the potential to go anywhere. Just anybody that you send to your website can understand you and what you do through a good story. And I think it's so underestimated and we get so caught up in the facts and the figures that it happened to me the other day. I was going to a, a meeting and I, I haven't done this in an in-person pitch meeting in a while, but I went and uh, it was an uphill battle for like 40 minutes. I'm telling her this, that, this and the other thing, right? And then she was like, let me see some of your work. And I showed her a video and like her and her assistant, tears everywhere. They didn't even know the organization, but it was just like, immediately I got a handshake, let's do business. And that's how like, it wasn't even our video. It was like another organization's video. And it was just so powerful that it did its job. It opened them up emotionally. I've just seen the power of it, a well-crafted video and story within that video. Love it. Good, good. How about your favorite nonprofit conference and why? So I didn't even really get into nonprofits until recently, but we've been speaking at a lot of them lately. But my favorite one so far was the nonprofit storytelling conference in San Antonio. We are speaking at the, the big innovation nonprofit marketing summit. I haven't been to that one yet, so I don't know yet. But so far, that was my favorite one. The in-person community and even the digital community on Whova was some of my favorite. So yeah, I'm, I'm eager to learn about more too. So I'm curious about yours. Yeah. And we'll include a link to the storytelling conference that's coming up in the fall of 2023 and the community boost. You mentioned the community boost nonprofit marketing uh, summit, which yeah. is digital and free to attend. I think it's February 28th. You can check it out. If it's appealing to you, you can register for free. The only Gotcha is you have to register and attend Jason's session and you have to attend my session. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not talking opposite each other. So Good. there you go. Now, it really is a big conference and it's I, they typically get 25,000 people who register. So it's a really big deal. Community Boost, check the show notes. All right. Last question, Jason. 
knowing what you know now about storytelling, what advice would you give your younger self just getting started in the profession? What advice would I give my younger self? Uh, you know, it's funny. My first company was AJ Video Productions. And, you know, my wife and I, yeah, Ashley, Jason. And secretly, I'm like, it's all Jason. Like, <laughs> that was the name. And I was like, I took pride on doing things myself. And I'm going to be camera. And I'm going to be lighting and audio. And I'm going to be editor. You just can't do it all yourself at all. Even now with business. Yeah, I try and write blogs. And I try and do social media posts and I try a new video. But I found that unless I have hired somebody to do it who is an expert in that field in particular, one, the accountability, because it just won't get done if it's on my shoulders. But two, it's their thing. And they take ownership of it and it's what they do all day, every day. So and this is hard advice for like if you're a nonprofit, but like just hire professionals is something that I say to yeah. myself. And once I like figured that out and that I couldn't do it all on my own and it's a team effort and I needed outside help from outside our team, like biggest advice I'd say to myself, it's not all Jason. Brilliant advice. Huh. Wisdom according to Jason. Thank you so much for joining us, Jason, and laying down so many incredible nuggets about storytelling and specifically video storytelling. So if you want to learn more about Jason or Beard and Bowler or follow him on social media, we've included links to his handles in the show notes, as well as links to check out his spectacular work online. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser podcast and keep on transforming your fundraising so you can transform the world. Bye for now. And now for a final word from our sponsor. Thank you to our friends at Bloomerang for supporting this episode. If you'd like to learn more about how Bloomerang can help your nonprofit acquire, retain, and engage donors, or learn how First Tee of Greater Akron doubled their unique donors, improved donor stewardship, and raised more funds in the first year with Bloomerang, head over to bloomerang.com forward slash intentional or click the link in the show notes. The Intentional Fundraiser Podcast is a Fundraising Transformed original. It's hosted by me, Tammy Zonker, founder and president of Fundraising Transformed, where we help equip and empower fundraisers, nonprofit leaders, and board members to transform their fundraising so they can transform the world. Visit fundraisingtransform.com slash podcast to subscribe to this podcast and subscribe to my newsletter to get fundraising lessons, tools, and helpful resources delivered straight to your inbox each month. If you want my help with taking your fundraising to the next level, become a member of my Fundraising Transformers community as a growth member and join me live each month where I'll teach you the same strategies I use to lead, train, and coach thousands of nonprofits, social service organizations, healthcare foundations, private schools, colleges, and universities to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars including a single gift of 27.1 million. As a member, you can participate in my Ask Me Anything sessions every month and get answers to your burning questions. Chat with other growth members inside our private and safe online community about what you're working on, struggling with, and share lessons learned. And get instant access to my growing library of on-demand self-paced training classes. New content is added every single month. Learn more about becoming a member at fundraisingtransform.com slash growth. Talk soon.